As summer starts coming to an end and we start feeling the effects of fall, one thing that we as gardeners start to think about is the condition of our soil, especially when it comes to the following year. Yesterday, I planted my three favorite cover crops in a ground bed and in two raised beds. And if you've ever considered planting cover crops to build your soil or for erosion control, or just because you've heard that they're good for your garden, I wanna show you my favorite three and how I'm using them and why I love them. That way, if you would like to start using cover crops, you can have a place to start. So I've been using cover crops for the last few years. And I know when I first started to dive into the subject of cover crops, I was very confused. I wasn't sure which ones would actually survive the winter, which ones I wanted to survive the winter, which ones I should choose, when I should plant, all of those questions. And when it came down to it, I just needed to try it. So after having a few years of experience, I just wanna show you the ones that I love and the ones that I keep using over and over again. I use cover crops in my ground bed and in my raised bed. And first I'm gonna take you to one of my raised beds. So we're in the area where I have a raised bed here. If you recall, this raised bed is where we harvested potatoes from. And then I planted a cover crop of buckwheat, which is my favorite cover crop to use over the summer because it's quick growing and it provides a really easy way to cover your soil with a cover crop if you have just a short window between crops. So I went ahead and took out the buckwheat and put it aside. And then I raked the soil around this raised bed. And that way, what I was able to do is to be able to have the soil ready to plant the cover crop that I wanted to plant in this bed. The cover crop I chose for this bed is hairy vetch. And what I love about hairy vetch is it's a nitrogen fixer. And then it also creates this beautiful mat of a living mulch, which is very handy in the spring. The good news is that hairy vetch actually will survive most winters. I believe it is hardy to about zone three. What you can expect with hairy vetch is that after you plant it, you'll see a little bit of growth in the fall and then it'll kind of stop growing over the winter time. And then in the springtime, it'll come back and it will create this dense mat wherever you plant it, which is perfect for planting transplants in the middle of it. That's why I love it as a living mulch because you already have this planting that is fixing nitrogen into the soil as your spring crops are growing. I have used this for cabbage and broccoli and tomatoes successfully. Another thing about hairy vetch that is really neat is that it develops these beautiful purple flowers. And I found this to be very helpful because if you plant it in the fall, the flowers will come on really early, which is great for those early pollinators, those bees that need some nectar in the beginning of the year. If you're planting crops like cucumbers and squash that sometimes have trouble pollinating because the pollinators aren't around, the hairy vetch blooms will help attract those pollinators as well. One thing too about hairy vetch is if you plant it in a flat bed, it's going to create this living mulch, like I said. But if you have a trellis nearby or any kind of vertical support, even a tomato stake, the hairy vetch will actually climb up. Now, this may be something that you want to keep in mind if you're growing a low growing crop that you don't want to be overtaken with a bunch of vertical growth. But as long as you don't have a trellis nearby, it's going to stay flat but it will climb if you give it something to climb. This may be good, it may not be good. I just wanted to let you know that that's some of the growth habit you can expect from the hairy vetch. I decided to plant hairy vetch in this bed because it is ideal, as I mentioned, to plant transplants into the following spring. It would be a little bit more difficult if you're planning to plant seeds just because it does develop this thick mat. What I normally do is whenever I get ready to plant my transplant, like I said, cabbage and tomatoes are usually my favorite, I will just spread the hairy vetch out and then dig a hole, plant the plant within the midst of the hairy vetch, and then let them all grow together. And so to me, this is a perfect cover crop, not only to keep the soil in place over the winter, preventing erosion, not only to fix nitrogen into the soil, not only to add organic matter over the winter in the early spring, but also serve as a living mulch for your spring crops and to attract beneficial insects and pollinators. This is one reason why hairy vetch is one of my favorites to use as a cover crop in the garden. Next, we're gonna head over to these two raised beds where I have my broccoli planted, and I'm gonna show you the crop that I use to oversow in the middle of the broccoli and why I use it. 
Another favorite cover crop of mine to use in the fall is crimson clover. Crimson clover is like hairy vetch in that it is a nitrogen fixer, but there are a couple of differences between the two. Number one, crimson clover tends to clump a little bit more, whereas hairy vetch spreads out. So that makes crimson clover a little bit more tidy and ruly. So if you just want some spot places where you have a cover crop, then crimson clover is a great thing to use. Another thing to keep in mind though is that crimson clover is typically only hardy to about zone six. So if you live in the cooler parts of zone six or any cooler parts of the country, then most likely it's going to kill over the winter time. It's not going to survive the winter. That doesn't mean don't use it though. It just means if you plant it a little bit earlier, make sure it gets enough time to be able to have enough growth in the fall before it's winter killed. This time of year, it's probably too late, but it's something you can think about in the future. Now, if you're in zone six or above, it's probably not too late to plant crimson clover now. Um, it may not grow very much in the fall. Most likely you may see a little bit of growth. And then in the springtime, just like hairy vetch, it will start to emerge probably late winter, early spring. And then it develops these beautiful red flowers that pollinators love. Now I like to use crimson clover here to plant as a living mulch in my fall garden. So what I just did is I scattered the seeds around my broccoli that I had already planted a couple of weeks ago and then I watered them in and then after that I can expect a little bit of growth in the fall. Now of course my broccoli is not going to overwinter, I'll have it harvested and done, but in the springtime I'm going to have a flush mat of crimson clover and if I want to pull it out and either compost it or uh, keep it in place on top of the soil before I plant any crops in the spring, I can do that. That would be the case if I decide to plant something like peas or anything that I'm going to sow seeds from. That's a big challenge with overwintered cover crops is that it's kind of hard to plant seeds if you want to keep them in place. And in my experience, when they overwinter, they actually produce the most biomass if they're allowed to completely mature and flower. If you're wanting to plant cool season crops really early, Early in a place where you have a cover crop that's overwintered, you have the choice of either completely cutting it down, which you totally can do, or letting it continue to grow and then planting around them. In that case, planting transplants like cabbage or broccoli or things like that would work really well amidst the crimson clover. But if you decide you want to direct seed a crop like carrots or beets or something like that, you probably will have to cut down the crop. Now, I'm a no-till gardener, obviously in raised beds, but also in my ground. And so if I do that, then I'll just cut it at soil level and I'll usually drop it in place. And then I would plant around that, or I could put the leaves and everything in the compost, or I can use it as a mulch in another place. To me, I try to use the cover crops as best as I can, but when it's all said and done, I just try to do the best with what I have and know that even if that crop's only job was to prevent erosion over the winter time and feed the fungal networks in the soil over the winter time and I have to cut them down early, I'm still okay with that. But in this case, I'm hoping that maybe I can plant some tomatoes in this bed or something like that and then I can plant them in the midst of the crimson clover just like I was able to do in the hairy vetch. So crimson clover would be another one that I highly recommend but my very favorite one is coming up. It's the one that I tried for the first time last fall and I have become a believer and here's why. You see this corn behind me? I cannot be more excited about this corn, partly because this corn is growing in an area of the garden that had really started to suffer. I started seeing signs that the soil had been started to get depleted and I actually made the decision last year to make this whole area fallow for, my goal was a year, I almost made it, but I just wanted to make it where I didn't have any kind of production crops going. So instead of just leaving it to not have anything in it because I do want to prevent erosion and I would love to plant something that will actually build the soil. I decided on a new cover crop and that is the garden cover crop blend from True Leaf Market. I initially chose this cover crop blend because if you do any research on cover crops, you can actually get information overload because there are so many different cover crops that do different jobs. Some of them 
fix nitrogen like hairy vetch and crimson clover. Some of them help break up compacted soils like radishes and rye and wheat. And some of them suppress diseases or weeds like mustard. And so there are lots of different functions for lots of different cover crops. And I think that's where we wonder, what should I plant? Well, this particular blend I chose because I thought I don't want to make a decision. I just want to plant something that has a little bit of everything. And that's what I did. First, I raked off the mulch from the area that I had grown in the garden this year. And then after that, I tried to rough up the soil just a little bit so I could have some seed to soil contact. Then I took my blend and I just scattered it on the surface of the soil. That's the beauty about cover crops too, if you haven't noticed, is that you really don't have to be exact in planting by rows or planting by depth or anything like that. I mean, there's recommended depths, but I just broadcast sowed them on top of the soil and I do that for my raised beds too. And then after I had the amount that I wanted on the land that I wanted, I took the rake again and I roughed up the top of the surface. So again, I could get some more of that seed to soil contact. From there, I took my garden hose because sadly we didn't have any rain in the forecast. Ideally, I would plan this ahead of a rain that would save this extra step, but I didn't have any rain in the forecast, so I wanted to saturate the area with water and that way the seeds and the soil could be moist enabling fast germination that's another benefit of planting fall cover crops is that your soil is still warm from the summer so they will sprout pretty quickly so after that i don't think i really would have needed to cover with the mulch again but i decided to do it because i saw in our forecast we were going to have like a really dry and even hot stretch in the 90s again. And so I took that same mulch and I just covered it back up very lightly. I found that a lot of seeds, as long as the mulch isn't thick and as long as it's a lighter mulch, which mine was, mine was a combination of some pine needles and some uh, straw left over from a straw bale garden and some broken down wood chips. I knew that that would be okay because it was very light. So the goal there was to cover just enough to be able to prevent evaporation and maybe hungry birds and also just not be too thick so that way the seeds can germinate. So last year, what ended up happening is the seeds germinated very quickly. And for the most part, I saw the mustards in this blend and I saw the peas and I think there was an oats blend maybe. So I saw a lot of those early on. What ended up happening was as we went into the winter time, the seeds in the blend that would be winter killed in my zone 7B, they ended up dying off. And of course that's going to create organic matter and biomass for the soil, which is fantastic but the seeds that would survive my winter in zone 7b, although many of these seeds are going to survive much colder than mine, they started growing a little bit like uh, the wheat and also the hairy vetch and the clovers. They started growing a little bit and then in the late winter, early spring, that growth just started to explode. Now I was grateful here that I didn't have an early spring crop to plant because this planting of this cover crop shown in its full glory about a month after our average last frost date. So here it was around the middle to the end of May. I had this tall cover crop that was very dense, lots of flowers with the hairy vetch and the clovers and even the mustards that were planted had started to go to flower, the ones that hadn't um, been winter killed. And so this was this beautiful array of multicolored flowers and I have not seen more beneficial insects like ladybugs and lacewings ever in my garden than I saw in this cover crop mix. And I was so delighted about that because I planted it to build the soil. And what I got was something to build the soil to prevent erosion and to add organic matter. But on top of that, I got this beautiful space where beneficial insects could thrive. And I absolutely loved it. So a big question that a lot of people have when it comes to cover crops, especially ones that you let get mature, like I did this cover crop mix, is what do you do with them? Well, I would say probably the later part of June, the early part of July, you just notice that the vigor stops. The flowers fade, they start eventually developing seed pods. So ideally you want to get the cover crop cut down before that, or you'll have volunteers coming up. And so probably the end of June, early part of July, I weed-eated the whole area. 
I took down the whole cover crop itself to the ground. I'm not, I don't till my garden, and so that is an option if you do, but since I don't, I weed eat it at the ground level. And then I kept the remains of the cover crop on top of the soil. And I even tried, if any of it like shot from the weed eater, I tried to rake it back. So I wanted all of that to stay in place. And what I found a couple of weeks later was that most of it was killed with the termination with the weed eater, but some ended up growing a little bit more, especially the wheat that had um, established really well. So I did one final weed eat to, to kill the rest of that. And then I was able to plant corn. Now, I really wasn't planning on planting corn. I was actually planning on letting that whole area be fallow, but I thought, you know, I hadn't planted corn this year. I actually hadn't gotten a good harvest this year and I really want corn. So let's just see. So in the middle of July, I planted corn and we are at the end of September and it's almost ready to harvest and it's absolutely beautiful. This is a garden bed that last year, every plant that I planted in it did okay, but didn't do great. I was noticing that the soil was being depleted over time, over many years of planting crops. And I could not be happier because corn is a heavy feeder. It loves nitrogen. And I could see a real difference in the soil and in the growth of this corn based on planting that cover crop in this area and then letting that organic matter settle in and decompose and I know that my soil is better for it. So because of that I'm like this is something I'm going to do every year and I think it's a great way to let the soil kind of rest for a longer period of time. Since I'm in Arkansas zone 7b we can grow probably 10 months out of the year maybe even more so that's a lot of it's a lot to ask a soil to produce for you that long since we don't have a long winter. So to be able to let it rest a little bit longer while getting fed by that cover crop mix and then being able to enjoy the beauty in the spring and then produce a fall harvest has been absolutely glorious. I have loved this so much. And the big thing to know is that I have not been growing cover crops that many years. There are so many different cover crops that I haven't tried yet, but these are the ones that I've found have been easiest for me as a beginner and the ones that I have seen the most benefit from. So if you're interested in trying cover crops in your garden, planting in September and October are generally the best months to do this, depending on your zone. If you live in a cooler area, you probably need to plant a little bit earlier. If you live in a warmer area, you can probably get away with planting a little bit later. One last thing I wanted to let you know that if you're watching this in real time, True Leaf Market is where I get all of my cover crop seeds and they are giving my listeners to my podcast and readers of the blog and you as YouTube viewers, 15% uh, off any of your cover crops. We'll have the coupon code in the description. Make sure to check that out so you can get 15% off. And I hope that you at least try it a little bit at a time. And I think you're going to see a huge benefit for more discussion on cover crops, actually how to do it in more in depth and also two other ones that I didn't mention today. Check out this episode of the Beginner's Garden podcast where I talk about my five favorite cover crops for a beginner. And I hope that this inspires you to make the choice to be able to build your soil with cover crops, if not this year, then in the years to come. Be sure to like and subscribe for more garden content like this, where I'm sharing with you what I'm doing in my garden and tests that I'm doing to help you be more successful in yours. <laughs>